know that those kinds of things happen all throughout history. We'll be talking with Senator Paul Simon about those and other issues next Inside Your Government. Good evening and welcome to Inside Your Government. I'm Paul Lisnick. Well, we all watched the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearings and thought it was sort of a circus and perhaps ridiculous. You might be surprised to know that's happened all throughout history. And a study of those uh, Supreme Court confirmation hearings has been done by Illinois' own Senator Paul Simon in a new book called Advice and Consent. And Senator, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Happy to be with you again. Well, this wasn't a first, huh? No, we've had we've had a variety of, uh, of scandals in quotes and and fights as a matter of fact one out of five Supreme Court nominee through our history has been turned down by the United States Senate in the last century it was one out of four it w was it just because television had its strongest impact this time around yes it, there's no question that that has made a huge difference so that when Clarence Thomas or even Robert Bork if, if when I asked the question you could hear that uh, in right here in suburban Cook County as quickly as I heard it in that hearing room. That makes it dramatically different than George Washington's fight on John Rutledge or Ulysses Grant's fight on George Williams that took place uh, many years ago. People learned it gradually through the newspapers. Well, in your book, Advice and Consent, where do you sort of end up? In other words, certainly the media circus, if that's what it was, will continue. And so as you, as you look throughout these hearings over time, uh, are we better or worse for it today? Well, what I suggest is that we continue to have things open. And, and it's interesting, up until 1939, uh, even the United States Senate discussion of Supreme Court nominations uh, was closed to the public. Uh, I, in doing research on my book, I asked for the Judiciary Committee hearings from when Ulysses S. Grant had his fight on the Chief Justiceship I was I surprised, was surprised to learn the first person who had ever asked for the Judiciary Committee notes. And so we went through, my wife and I went through these handwritten notes from the Judiciary Committee of, uh, of many years ago. But uh, the media has made it very different. And uh, in my book, I conclude by saying both the President and the Senate can handle it better. And in the case of the Senate, I think it can handle it better by when there is a charge, that, then that charge ought to be dealt with in a closed hearing and then a report made to the public, uh, not everything out on television. If I can use this example, suppose uh, that we have another nominee and someone comes up and says, 10 years ago, this person embezzled $100,000. Do we immediately go on national television with that? Or do we hold a closed hearing where Senators, frankly, are trying to get the truth and not play to the television cameras. Uh, I think we're better off in when there is a serious charge like that to hold it behind closed uh, behind closed doors. But the other things, wh wh when we ask them what their views are on privacy or church-state relations or you know all of these other things. Those ought to be out in the public the way they are right now. Well, let, let, let's consider that for a moment, because a parallel may be the, the election going on between George Bush and Bill Clinton. Uh, and when there were disclosures of President Bush's supposed extramarital affair, uh, of course, the press had its own internal fight over that. And one of the issues, at least that one of the publishers of that material said was, hey, look, he's a leader of this land. And as a right, uh, and as a consequence, we have a right to know who he's sleeping with, who he's eating with, and what he had for dinner. If, do you agree with that? And if so, wouldn't that apply over to somebody who will be on the highest court of the land? Well, I, I would partially disagree with it in that I don't think we ought to expect perfection from senators or 
presidents or presidential candidates or even uh, TV uh, talk show hosts. Well, we fall into that uh, category. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that we, uh, we ought to focus primarily on the issues and not uh, now you you have to but focus. is that an issue senator if, if somebody has something in their past like embezzlement 10 years oh, that, ago yes now that's a serious issue but but I think the question is how you handle it now in the course of a campaign if one of the candidates brings it out or the press brings it out that's a very different thing but in the case for example of Anita Hill's charge that was given confidentially to the Judiciary Committee and then we frankly did nothing with it uh, or the chairman of the committee did nothing with it anyway until well he what he did do was turn it over to the FBI and ask the FBI to make an investigation but at some point the and leak had in fact had there not been some sort of leak wherever that came from that may not have come out that that is exactly the point and and my point is rather than suppressing it because it was uh, given by uh, Anita Hill on a confidential basis what the committee should have done was to have a closed door session uh, taking a look at the FBI report, examining uh, Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas on it, and then making a report to the public and, and to the Senate. Well, given that it all did come out, I think the public response to that would be, wait a minute, we do want to know about that. We, we've got a right to know. Um, the only point is we have no influence ultimately on the Senate's decision, other than through the voting, uh, which happened, of course, in consequence Senator Yeah, Dixon. well, and they do have an influence. I don't think there's any question. I, as I point out in the book, Robert Bork, when he came up, before the hearing, the majority of the American public, according to the polls, favored his nomination. After he testified for a few days, the majority of the public changed their mind. And that had an influence on the Senate. I, I frankly think we have too many senators and people in other positions also who hold their finger to the wind and say, what is public opinion today? Uh, so uh, I, I think, but in the in the case of a charge, uh, I, I think you don't ignore it, but you don't put a charge on national television if there is no substance to it. Now, in this case, uh, and I have a chapter in the book on qu the question of who told the truth. I think there is uh, ample evidence that there was uh, there was substance to the charge, but I think initially we should have had it behind closed doors. Do you think that the Senate has a right to step in and question the president's selection of a Supreme Court justice? And by that I mean, uh, there's some to say that, that if there's issues of, of this person's political bends or leaning in an abortion issue or anything else, it's really not, the, the Senate is there to, well, as you say, provide advice and consent. But the choice belongs to the president. No, the, the choice belongs to the president, but uh, the phrase in the Constitution is advice and consent, not simply consent. Uh, it is very interesting. In 1787, when they wrote the Constitution, up until the next the last day of writing the Constitution, uh, they had the Senate appointing the members of the Supreme Court, not the President. And then they said, well, let's work it out so that they're, you know, they work together on it. And when presidents have worked together with the Senate, and, uh, and frankly, not just with the Senate, but consulted people around the nation, then it has worked out well. If I can contrast how they handled it. George Bush, uh, five days after a vacancy occurred, nominated Clarence Thomas and said he was the best person in the nation, submitted his name to the American Bar Association. Gerald Ford, another Republican president, uh, consulted with a number of members of the Senate consulted with people around the nation and asked who would be the best possible person to be on the Supreme Court. Then from all these names, he picked 20, submitted 20 names to the American Bar Association and said, I'd like your evaluation on all 20. And then he made the final selection. And his nomination went through unanimously. Uh, I Part think of it was the way Bush handled it. That is exactly right. No question about it. Bush ignored the advice part of advice and consent. Well, taking the, the personality or character issues of Clarence Thomas out of it for a moment, if we, right. which we have to because he's on the Supreme Court, one of the issues raised was that Thomas really didn't even have the intellectual capacity, whatever that means, to serve on the court. And those issues seem to never really come into the equation. Yes, I, I think that he, I voted uh, against him for one job in the Senate for uh, when he was up for chairmanship of the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. I voted for him for the appellate court. 
I think that he was, while he is not overwhelming in his intellectual capacities, I think he has the basic stuff to make a good Supreme Court justice in terms of intellectual capacity. I think his problem is more his attitude on fundamental issues, affirmative action, sympathy to those less fortunate. Uh, I think in, in those areas, I don't think he's qualified, but that's you know, that's a philosophical judgment. I well, think that's really the problem with the Clarence Thomas nomination. Now, in your book, you, you talk about the fact that there was some validity to Anita, Anita Hill's charges, whatever that, whatever that right. is. And so that would mean that Clarence Thomas, who said undeniably he denies every allegation, lied. I, I don't think there's any question about it. And I think that happened before the Anita Hill part of it. As I go through the book, there, there are other instances. For example, on the abortion issue, the Roe v. Wade decision, when he said he didn't remember discussing it and he had no opinion on it. Now, uh, I've never discussed the Roe v. Wade decision with you, but you have an opinion on it. Those people running the cameras here have an opinion on the abortion decision. Uh, it is very difficult to believe that they don't have, that here is a person who is steeped in the law who has served on the appellate court, who has no opinion whatsoever on that. And that was true of several other issues where uh, I think it was clear he, he was not telling us the truth. And yet he was confirmed, and at least in one case here in Illinois, with regards to your colleague and unfortunately soon to be former colleague, uh, Alan Dixon, it cost him a job. Or that is, do you think? that that issue cost Dixon the yes, election. I, I would go back and, and make one minor correction what you had to say in the, in, when you say, yet he was confirmed. That is true, but when he went into the hearings, majority of the members of the Judiciary Committee were inclined to support him. But the vote, and this is before the Anita Hill portion of the, of the hearing, the vote in the committee turned out seven to seven uh, for him. And, and ultimately he was confirmed, as you say. But it was clear that members of the committee had uh, real misgivings about uh, Clarence Thomas's nomination before the Anita Hill matter came so up. So were you surprised when Senator Dixon, a Democrat, stepped aside from your own position on the issue and you were in the thick of things? Well, the, these are uh, decisions we all have to make uh, judgment calls. Uh, I differed with Alan Dixon on that, though I supported him for the nomination for, for the Senate and I am supporting Carol Mosley Braun right uh, now. Uh, but uh, we didn't, Alan Dixon and I don't, didn't always vote the same. If Carol's elected, we won't always vote the same. You, you have to make judgment calls, and I respect those who differ with me on things. Uh, do you think that that was the downfall of Dixon, or were there other issues going on? Well, I, I think there were other issues that came out during the campaign, but I think if he had voted against Clarence Thomas, he would not have had opposition in the primary. I don't, I don't think there's any question. That was the cause of the downfall of Alan Dixon in terms of his political downfall. Is there any sense of responsibility among the confirmation members of the Senate that you guys sort of single-handedly, if you will, triggered the year of the woman? Well, uh, there, there's always responsibility. You know, there, there are always repercussions and things you do when you're in positions of, of leadership. But let me add, there were some positives that came out of all of this. One was, thanks to the courage of Anita Hill, uh, we experienced a cultural earthquake on the whole question of sexual harassment. I have to say, as a, a man, I did not understand the dimensions of the problem before all of this uh, occurred. Uh, I received literally hundreds of letters from women who had gone through similar experiences. Uh, I received a letter from a woman my wife and I have known for a number of years. She said, my husband and I have been married for 40 years. We were watching television, and all of a sudden, uh, I started sobbing, and he asked me what's wrong, and uh, I told him what happened to me when I was 18 years old. Uh, men have become more sensitized, and women are standing up. Uh, women who up until this point thought themselves very alone and who had a combined feeling of guilt and anger about what had happened to them. Senator, I want to take a look. The book is Advice and Consent. We want to take a look at some other national issues with you when we come back after these words. Stay with us. Speak up if you want to be heard. 
I think that's what America really wants, is, is just honesty. Your vote is your voice. I just think that someone, somebody's got to stand up and, and uh, somebody's got to take control. You can make a difference. Tell your friends, you know, be a, uh, listen to the news, read the newspaper, spread the word. You gotta vote for somebody you believe in. Every single vote counts. It's your future. Start taking control of it now. Register and vote. Aren't you proud of the scenic beauty of Illinois? Sometimes we may forget what a magnificent state Illinois is. From sunrise over Lake Michigan to the beauty of the Shawnee National Forest, nature is all around us. And all of us must take responsibility to maintain this beauty for generations to come. You can make a difference. Call the Illinois Department of Conservation to find out more. Take pride in America and take pride in Illinois. Welcome back to Inside Your Government, where we're talking with Senator Paul Simon, Democrat from Illinois, uh, about the Clarence Thomas and Edie Hill hearings. And now let's turn to some other issues, Senator. We're in the middle of a presidential race, and some are claiming that this race between Bush and Clinton will be perhaps the dirtiest in history. Where do you see it going? Well, I hope that's not the case. I, I hope we focus on the real issues. There is a tendency in both parties from time to time to focus on non-issues. If, if I can use an example, the whole question of... Family values? Fa well, family values gets to be a little phony. Uh, I, I think it properly constructed, it can be a uh, legitimate discussion. But that, that means discussion about family uh, medical leave, uh, jobs for people, medical care, things like that. But the whole religion factor, the fact that uh, the Democratic Convention didn't uh, use the word God in our platform, uh, I really, my, my father was a Lutheran minister, my brother's a Lutheran minister, but I was pleased to see the statement issued by a group of Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish leaders saying God is neither a Republican nor a Democrat, he's not even an American. I shouldn't even say he, he, he or she is not an American, yes. When you looked at the Republican convention, and we all, of course, watched it happen, were you astounded by the, by the efforts to both invite everybody into the fold but at the same time offend so many groups through the speeches of Pat Buchanan and, and some of the others. How did you watch as a, as a Democratic senator? Well, I thought particularly, and you mentioned the one speech that I thought was particularly offensive was the, the Pat Buchanan speech. I, I think it was, you know, when it says, look, we're going to retake our cities, and uh, in the Los Angeles riots talked about sympathizing with the Korean merchants. We all sympathize with them but saying nothing about the problems of blacks and Hispanics and those less fortunate in those areas. Uh, I think what offended me most was the, the, the insensitivity that came across. Uh, I, I don't think George Bush is a mean man. I like him personally. But uh, he didn't mention the word poverty, didn't mention those who are unemployed and those face, facing serious problems in our society. I, I think. And, and maybe this is part of family values. Family values means not just taking care of yourself, but reaching out to others. And can that's what we have to do in our society. We, we, we don't want to become another Yugoslavia. Do you get a sense that they wanted it both ways, that George Bush can take the position of saying, we welcome everybody, and then they'll send Barbara Bush on to say, whatever family means to you, that's what it means to us? Well, there is no question that Barbara was brought in uh, to assist in the overall situation, and she's very popular, and I like her a great deal. I think she is, she has some stronger convictions, frankly, than her husband does, and uh, that's really George Bush's weakness: is that he he's a man of inclination rather than conviction, and leadership requires conviction. Will Hillary Clinton prove to be Bill Clinton's weakness? No, no, Hillary Clinton. Uh, is going to continue, let's just assume that Bill Clinton is elected. Hillary Clinton will be like Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, you, this is before your time here. Oh, now. I've done my reading. <laughs> All right. But Eleanor Roosevelt was a person of some controversy, but contributed a great deal. And I think you'll see Hillary Clinton doing the same. I think uh, she's going to be a great asset to the, the president if Bill is elected president. But she challenges tradition. Doesn't she? She challenges tradition, but Eleanor Roosevelt challenged tradition. 
Eleanor Roosevelt reached out to the minority community. She went down in coal mines and talked about the plight of coal miners. She, you know, she helped to, to lead the nation to understanding the, the plight of those less fortunate. Would Hillary Clinton be advised by you to tie herself to Eleanor Roosevelt in her efforts? Would that help her today? Oh, no, I, I would just advise uh, Hillary, and she doesn't need my advice, first of all, but uh, just to be herself. Her instincts are good. What do you think of George Bush's tie to Harry Truman? And in fact, in a recent article by, by uh, Truman's daughter, who used the proverbial phrase by now from Senator Benson, George Bush, you're no Harry Truman. Yeah. Well, it is, he is not. Uh, Harry Truman was a person of very strong convictions. Um, George Bush is a person almost without convictions. I know, I, that, that's a little too categorical. But uh, that's his real weakness. Harry Truman got into political trouble because his convictions were so strong and he just moved ahead. But as we look back, history is very generous to Harry Truman. He turned out to be uh, one of our better presidents. You, know, and you, you can fault some of the things that he did, but overall, it was a great record. It, this seems to be an election of fears. That is to say, people probably feel a lot more comfortable with Bush on a foreign policy basis than they do with Bill Clinton, but at the same time, they look ahead and, and, and feel that Bush has no sight for what's happening domestically. How do you think that'll weigh out come November? I think domestic politics tends to dominate though I would differ with those who are quite so satisfied with George Bush on foreign policy. I think we have been too inclined to cozy up to dictators. And that is true, you know, Saddam Hussein is a prime example. But I would say Assad in Syria, I would say the leaders in China, uh, where we should have been out there leading and saying, what's going on at Tiananmen Square is wrong. We're on the side of the students who favor freedom. Uh, I remember right after it happened, I spoke to a group of several thousand Chinese students uh, at Grant Park. We should have had the President of the United States out there leading uh, on that. Uh, we shouldn't hesitate to stand for freedom. Look, Iraq, let me give you another illustration. And I've talked to Jim Baker a couple of times on this. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has said he's for a, a democracy in Iraq. The president of France has said he's for a democracy in Iraq. The president of the United States has yet to say we're for a democracy in Iraq. Now, when I push, the State Department comes back and says, well, it may be a military coup and you may have another military dictator rather than a democracy and you don't want to turn off the coup. Uh, frankly, if we substitute one military dictatorship for another military dictatorship, we haven't won anything, really. And, and so I think we ought to stand up much more squarely for democracy. Zaire, this is not a big headline thing, but in, in Africa, Zaire used to be the Belgian Congo. Uh, they have a military dictator by the name of Mobutu. The people are, you know, you know clearly massive public unrest, um, huge amount of corruption. Uh, we ought to be saying much more clearly, we're for democracy in Zaire. We're not doing it. Well, President is strong as those who surround him, so Jim Baker assists him in making that policy, and now Baker gets brought in to be domestic. Can he turn this election around? Does Baker have the influence to do it? Well, I don't know that Baker has the influence to do it. I think his political instincts are pretty good. I like Jim Baker, incidentally. I think he, uh, fundamentally he did a pretty good job in foreign affairs. Jim Baker did. Was it I think the shots were called by the President. In, in the case of Mobutu, for example, I remember calling Sam Skinner and saying, uh, Mabut, the people in Zaire say the United States is siding with the dictator against the people. We ought to be doing something. And uh, Sam Skinner made clear that the president felt that uh, Mobutu was with us when we were in the Cold War against the Soviet Union. Don't turn your back on your, on your friends. And I said, Sam, it's like someone who helped Bush in a presidential election and you put them on the White House staff and they embezzle funds. You don't say, oh, they were with us when it counted. You get rid of them. Well, that sounds actually like the, the Bush philosophy, one of loyalty. And that's always going to carry through. Let me ask you, back in the domestic world, was it a mistake keeping Dan Quayle on the ticket? He seemed to be sort of damned if he did and damned if he didn't. I think the mistake was putting Dan Quayle on the ticket in the first place. But he did it, and then the issue is, should he live with it in 1992? Well, I think you really have to, a president ought to say, 
who would be the best possible person to become president if something happened to me. And I think, and, and I like Dan Quayle personally. We served in the Senate and the House together. But uh, I, don't, I don't think he would make a strong president. I don't think he would be a good president. Now, he's been worked on, obviously. I mean, Dan Quayle knows how to deal with the media quite a bit better than he did four years ago. And in watching him recently on some of the, the news shows on television, he almost doesn't let questions get in. He's got his position to state. He's the bulldog he, he claimed to be. Uh, what's your impression of how the American public is going to react to that over time? Well, I, all I can do is go by polls. And the polls show that 23% of the American public believe Dan Quayle is qualified to be president if there's an emergency. 69% believe that uh, Al Gore is, pres is qualified to be president. And I think a, a better judgment would be in the United States Senate. Uh, if you were to take a secret poll in the United States Senate uh, as to which one of the two is better equipped to take over the presidency in an emergency, I don't think there's any question Al Gore wins that vote. Though, would you suggest the American public doesn't need to get to that issue? The real question is, who do you want to be president, George Bush or Bill Clinton? Yes, but I think we also ought to be thinking about these other things. And now, uh, what the Dan Quayle candidacy makes clear is who you pick for vice president probably doesn't make very much difference in terms of an election. But we ought to be thinking about who uh, will be there in an emergency, because one out of three vice presidents have become president. We ought to be thinking about who's going to be appointed to the United States Supreme Court. We ought to be, you know, these things that are not the obvious things ought to be under consideration in an election. Will Ross Perot's presence on the ballot still have any effect? It could. It could in certain key states. How in, about Illinois? Uh, Illinois, my guess is that it won't, but if it is a very close election, it could. Uh, and Illinois tends to have close elections. In Texas, for example, I think there it might very well uh, be decisive. But, uh, and Texas is a state with a lot of electoral votes. Uh, I think in part it depends on how Ross Perot conducts himself between now and then. Uh, I, uh, it, it is fairly clear Ross Perot has some regrets for having pulled out so abruptly, and now he's trying to put his toe back in the water, but you can't withdraw and jump back in and be a credible candidate. Well, the Republicans already have tabbed him as Ross who, so they're pretty much putting the wall up to keep him out. Well, but he's going to be on the ballot in 38 or more states. So that if he draws a significant amount, uh, he could be a factor. Uh, John Anderson, as a third party candidate, drew about 6% of the vote nationally. Now, as it turned out, that in that election, it didn't make that much difference. In a very tight election, and this could turn out to be a tight election before it's over, Ross Perot's presence could make a difference in key states. They say as Illinois goes, so goes the country. Which way do you think Illinois will eventually go? Can Edgar deliver as Jim Thompson did? Well, I don't think that he, I don't think Jim Thompson really delivered. I, and I don't mean that disrespectfully to, to Jim, but uh, I don't think that uh, a governor or a senator or anyone else can deliver. Yes, they endorse, they help. I endorse, I help. But uh, the public today, they're going to they watch that television tube, they read the newspapers, they make their own judgment. And uh, my guess is that Illinois will go for Bill Clinton, but. Uh, uh, the Chicago Tribune poll that came out the other day showing him with a sizable lead, I think you'll see that lead narrow. Senator Paul Simon, thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Great to be with you again. I advise everybody to read your book, Advice and Consent on the History of the Supreme Court Nominations, and my thanks for the little bow tie, which will always remind me of you. Thank you. We'll see you next week on Inside Your Government. I'm Paul Lisnick. Good night.